America loves to tout war and military service as a way to protect people and spread democracy and freedoms in other nations. Yeah, about that. Pretty much every civil intervention we've done ends in disaster, creating authoritarian regimes. Starting in World War I with, by today's borders, would have been a European civil war, we stuck our nose in big time into the war, forcing draconian reparations on Germany, screwing over China massively, and dividing the former Ottoman Empire along lines meant to keep them at each other's throats, and invading Russia to fight the Bolsheviks. It's believed that had we not interfered with many revolutions, they would have been much more inclusive and democratic and consensus-based. Instead, we helped hand them the victory, and they, having now all the power and leverage, settle old scores mercilessly. We then had to fight World War II to fix the blunders of World War I. It's believed by some historians that had the Germans won in World War I, this world would have been a lot more peaceful and a lot less imperialistic. Then we had the Korean War which was left as a stalemate ceasefire and the southern Korean leader was an authoritarian dictator for a while. We overthrew the elected government of Iran and installed the Shah, which backfired with the Iranian revolution leading to an extremist Islamic regime. Eisenhower backed extreme Islamic groups over secular progressive governments in fear that they would be allies to the communists. This led to authoritarian radical governments. We blindly backed Israel, which led to their hardline radical religious treatment of Palestinians, removal of land, and apartheid. We backed fascist dictators in South and Central America, some all in favor of banana and sugar companies' bottom line. We helped Pinochet overthrow the only democratically elected communist government of Chile with freedom and democracy and replace it with a fascist brutal regime. We backed Saddam and the Taliban until we hated them. When we invaded Iraq the second time, we handed power to the Shiites, and they held all the wealth and leverage and essentially ignored the plights of the Sunni due to old debts and scores. The rise of the Islamic State may have been the only thing to save the nation of Iraq from falling apart entirely as it forced a more inclusive leader, who at least pretended to hear the Sunni's issues, to come to power. The Afghanistan intervention hasn't fared much better with corruption at every level, ensuring so long as we're there, peace will never truly come. Civil wars are internal national struggles. They're often class struggles. They are harsh, violent, brutal, and painful. However, there are some things that make them worse. War profiteering and interventionism. War profiteers will sell to extend the conflict further. There's a theory that if former G8 nations in China agreed to stop selling arms to either side of the Syrian conflict, the war would be over in months once they ran out of ammo. They would have to come to some sort of power sharing agreement even if it was an uneasy agreement, similar to Lebanon. However, so long as they keep getting weapons on both sides, the war keeps going. Interventionism just gives all the power to one side, and the other side becomes a brutalized group of second-class citizens. So the group in power becomes a tyrant, and later on, often, our worst enemies. There are only a few cases where interventionism actually improved things. That was post-World War II Europe with the Marshall Plan and the forcing of not only democracy and freedom on Germany, Japan, and Italy, but also economic equality measures. With the Marshall Plan, we helped build their infrastructure in much more modern ways, and they got themselves back on their feet. With income equality, they were able to feed their poorest and most vulnerable. Eisenhower implemented a lot of socialist-style programs, not out of socialist ideology, but because he saw what poverty and desperation could do to a nation where they would follow fascism if they couldn't survive. It's why World War II and the Bosnian Wars are roughly the only interventions that were even close to a positive outcome. Sadly, Bush Jr. pretended to do the same thing in Iraq and Afghanistan, but with no force of income equality and no bid contractors to do the repairing, so some buildings literally melted in the rain. The IMF and the World Bank also used financial intervention in nations that ended in decades of civil war and dictators thanks to their belief that corruption was just the culture of Africa, so they gave money and loans to brutal dictators and corrupt leaders to line their own pockets, and the money had to be repaid on the backs of the poor citizens. That's shifted in the past 10 years, and Africa is exploding in prosperity compared with all the rest of the post-colonial existence, now that we've stopped viewing corruption as part of a culture and more as a disease that can infect any culture. Without war, what do we do? Well, I propose four new volunteer corps that will teach young people discipline, give them a college education, and help prevent war in the future. The first is the Science Corps, which I mentioned in my series that we need a science industrial complex where young people can join, do the menial grunt work for large-scale science projects, and get both experience and at least their associates from the experience upon completion. 
Next comes the Medical Corps. We can replace the military and disease crisis hotspots like the Ebola crisis in West Africa. They also can get at least an AS in experience and be ready to come back and help our aging population. The Construction Corps is next. Most poor nations don't need shoes or clothes or food. They need roads and dependable electricity, then they can easily make their own. A good construction corps would fix this, giving them at least an AS as well as world experience. Sadly, China is doing this, but in a way to get as much out of the nations as possible without paying attention to the needs of the people. So it's still better than what America does with aid to corrupt leaders and bombs. So China is winning the soft power game we should be winning. These are big projects with massive numbers of people involved and a culture of corruption ensures so much of it gets whittled away that by the time all the money is spent, it's a shoddy piece of workmanship that's barely reliable. Luckily at the moment for some villages, solar panels are helping them out because they don't need to rely on big infrastructure, but it's a big upfront cost certain sections of them can't afford. Next, the teaching core. Get their people trained up in important skills and areas and put in place an ability to create more teachers. These would move them from the lower three and get their bachelors on completion, giving them experience to be teachers in America. After that point, people could join the Peace Corps, which may just dwindle and become pointless over time, or be the leaders or the ground data collectors for the other three foreign corps. Once infrastructure worldwide is up to par, they would be there in case of disaster to rebuild. If a civil war breaks out, both sides would know that if they won and stood for freedom, democracy, and income equality, they would benefit from a freshly rebuilt infrastructure system. Carrots, not sticks. The military would still exist, just as actual defense and a deterrent. But if we do have to intervene in the case of threat of genocide, as was the case of Libya, we would have powerful tools to help beyond just bombs. It's believed that with a Marshall Plan, the Arab Spring would have fared so much better than it did, instead of collapsing in the chaos and instability it caused. And we would not only have to enforce freedom and democracy, but also income equality, because one cannot eat freedom nor care for their families with just democracy.